right, hello, welcome to our fourth session. Um, this is our second to last session. I'm very excited about this. I'm Ashley Hall from the 4-H faculty in Snohomish County and absolutely thrilled to have this fantastic opportunity for, for everyone. I'm glad to see some, some folks that I've seen in every session so far. So I'm gonna turn it over to Adasha of Modest Family Solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Adasha with Modest Family Solutions here in Everett, Washington. Um, uh, Everett, Washington, we're also uh, affiliated with Washington State University Extension 4-H. Um, we brought facts over fear um, to the Everett Snohomish area to address a lot of the issues and concerns um, as myself and having um, a, a minority mix um, gardening program, you know, coming to Snohomish County and a lot of misinformation that was there. So I took it upon myself to bring the Facts Over Fear um, program to WSU. So that way we can kind of have a platform to address a lot of these issues that are going on, giving folks a chance and opportunity to ask questions and really get familiar and get to know your Muslim neighbors and uh, recognize that we have a lot of things in common, you know, and putting it on a more positive tone and positive light versus the negativity that's been out there. So, um, I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to Terry so he can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Adasha and, and Ashley. And my name is Terry Kylo. I'm a Lutheran pastor. I've uh, been serving for about 30 years in that capacity. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Um, part of the reason I got into this was just recognizing, you know, some of those negative messages out there and that, uh, and that we, we really need to counter them whenever we hear them. Uh, no matter what group is being impacted or affected by that. And I'm just so happy to be with all of you and to work again with uh, Anila Afzali. Um, and you know, the only hard thing about working with Anila as a person that grew up in La Crosse, Washington and, and am a Cougar fan is that she's a Ducks fan, but I'm gonna try to you know, deal with that. I've, I've tried over the years to be patient, but it is such an honor to be uh, with, with Anila again and to do work with her on an ongoing basis to build our common humanity and to live up to our constitutional aspirational values as a country. Uh, Anila, how are you doing today? Hello, everybody, and thank you, dear brother Terry. Uh, at the very least, we can all agree to, that we're Seahawks fans, I hope. So maybe we can connect on that, finding commonalities. Uh, but welcome, everybody, to, to this fourth session of our Facts Over Fear webinar series. Uh, my name is Anila Afzeli. I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound and also on the board of the Faith Action Network. Uh, as I've said before, I am a proud American Muslim woman. Uh, I'm also a recovering attorney. Uh, I left my legal career in 2013 after I had a spiritual transformation that really uh, brought me back to my faith. And since then, I've been working on bridge building and really living out my faith values of sort of service, of building bridges, of loving our neighbors, uh, and really just sort of serving God, uh, worshiping God by serving his creation. Uh, I've also been pursuing our aspirational American values uh, of sort of uh, freedoms, including religious freedom, uh, fairness and dignity, and liberty and justice for all. And after gr uh, witnessing the growing divide in our country and the misinformation campaign against Islam and Muslims, I was very honored to work with my dear brother, Terry Kylo, in creating this Facts Over Fear uh, series that we're so honored to get to share with all of you. And it's great to see some familiar uh, names uh, uh, joining us again as well for this session. So with that, let me pass it over to my brother, uh, Terry Kylo, to kick us off for this week on uh, the topic of what is Sharia. Yeah, so this is a really important topic. And Anila and I were you know, just had a great time putting these five animated videos together with a really great team of animators. And uh, I should mention that, that, uh, that I work uh, right now with Paths to Understanding. I'm the executive director of that organization. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. And so we're, um, I'm gonna share my screen here and, and we're gonna watch the video. It'll last about three and a half minutes or so. Sharia is simply an Arabic term that refers to Islamic teachings. These include things like praying five times a day, fasting, giving in charity, being kind to parents, forgiving those who do you wrong, loving your neighbor, 
standing for truth and justice, similar to teachings of other faith traditions. Unfortunately, there are a lot of conspiracy theories on the internet by anti-Muslim hate groups about Islam and Muslims. Contrary to the misinformation campaign by the multi-million dollar Islamophobia industry, the reality is that Islam is one of the world's major religions and shares many values with Judaism and Christianity. As one of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam teaches similar stories to the Bible, including about Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Muslims further believe in all the prophets, and believe prophets were sent to teach us the same essential message, to love and worship the one true God, and to love and do good to God's creation. Islam further teaches similar basic values of compassion, mercy, justice, and charity, like other faith traditions. Linguistically, Sharia means a path that leads to water. The idea is that just as a thirsty animal seeks a path to water, we as human beings are spiritually thirsty, and Sharia provides a path toward fulfilling our spiritual thirst as human beings. Islamic teachings include the command to follow the laws of the land in which you live. So here in our country, it would include upholding the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of our land. In our country, one of the values we cherish as Americans is religious freedom. Those who seek to ban Sharia are in fact seeking to ban Islamic teachings, which strips American Muslims of their right to practice their faith. Singling out and seeking to prohibit a minority group from practicing their religion is un-American, unconstitutional, and immoral. Such attacks on our fundamental constitutional values jeopardize the freedom of all Americans. The best way to protect the religious freedom of all Americans is to uphold and preserve the right of each to freely practice their faith, just as the First Amendment mandates. So let's stand united as Americans against attacks on the rights and freedoms of any group, including American Muslims. Well, thank you all for, for watching that video with us. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my sister Anila to help give us a bit more of an introduction into what Sharia, Sharia means for Muslims around the world. Thank you so much, dear brother Terry. Uh, so Sharia really is one of the most misunderstood concepts for a lot of people when they think about Islam. And part of that has been because there was this entire negative propaganda campaign against it. Uh, and the same thing was done with other words as well, like the word jihad that we talked about in our, I believe, our second webinar series week. Uh, and what the sort of anti-Muslim hate ind industry has effectively done is to take a foreign word that nobody knows, like Sharia, and then ascribe certain horrible meanings to it and justify that horribly wrong definition with identifying certain behavior of individual sort of Muslim criminals or sort of Muslim countries that may not be following what it actually is supposed to be about. So it's so important to keep in mind a point that I made last week when we were talking about Islam and women's rights, that it's so important, let me make sure I share my screen here, it is so important for us to keep in mind that what you see happening in some Muslim majority countries or by some individual Muslims is not necessarily the same as what Islam actually teaches. And second, there's so much diversity in the Muslim population. There are almost 50 different Muslim majority countries and about 80 countries where Muslims make up a sizable minority of 10% or more. So we cannot talk about Muslims or uh, uh, Muslim states as a monolith. And as you heard in the video, Sharia really is Islamic teachings, that's all. And it literally means sort of a pathway to water, uh, a way to connect to God. And the concept of Sharia, of, of teachings from God, were given to prior prophets as well. The Torah, or Ten Commandments, to Moses, peace be upon him. The Psalms, to David, peace be upon him. The Injil, or Gospel, to Jesus, peace be upon him. Those are all part of Islamic teachings as well, because Muslims are commanded to believe in all the prior prophets and the prior revelation given to them. 
In fact, chapter two, verse 136 of the Quran command believers to even say, we have believed in God and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the descendants and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. Another important point to keep in mind is that there is no specific book of Sharia or one interpretation, whether throughout history or today. There has always been and continues to be so much diversity around interpretation of Sharia. Now, there are specific sources of Sharia, which include the Quran, the Hadith, which are sayings or teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, along with analogy and consensus of the scholars. But there's no single book of Sharia that you can point to because it's more of like an abstract concept. Like think of if I said justice, you know, there's things you can point to that sort of talk about justice, but there is no sort of one set of like rules uh, that specifically help explain justice for all times. It differs throughout history uh, and depending on context. So Sharia really is a set of principles or a code of ethics rather than a list of rules. And it governs all aspects of life for Muslims who seek to align their life with Islamic values or moral teachings of Islam. And this includes in marriage, divorce, finances, and then rituals such as fasting and prayer and more. And part of why Muslims love Sharia is because it grants and protects rights, rights of all people. And the human effort to try to interpret divine teachings and draw applicable rules from Sharia, from sort of God-given uh, sort of guidance is fiqh, it's, it's called fiqh. And there are books of fiqh. So there are books of sort of human interpretations of, of Sharia. This includes books on marriage, divorce, inheritance, prayer, fasting, the pilgrimage, contracts, and more. And fiqh, that human understanding, it's fallible, it's diverse, it varies with context and over time. And importantly, these rulings that are drawn by human beings from sort of Islamic teachings, they are that human attempt, they do not apply to non-Muslims. So I wanna repeat that. The interpretation or rulings of Sharia are not intended to apply to those who are not Muslim. This is because Islamic teachings or Sharia only apply to those who choose Islam as their faith traditions. And in, in Islam, there is no compulsion in religion. You cannot force somebody to believe. Now, I'm not saying that they won't have an impact on non-Muslims. Like for me, you know, I don't, I don't need pork. Uh, I'm actually vegan, so I don't need any meat. But when I go over sort of a friend's house, my decision might have an impact on them because they have to cook a different meal, for instance, right? So it could have impact on non-Muslims. And in certain Muslim-majority countries, it might be hard to gamble or find alcohol or find pork even. Uh, so there could be impact on non-Muslims. But again, it's not intended to govern the behavior of non Muslims, it's specifically for governing the, the providing guidance for Muslims. And the main objectives of Sharia are to preserve human life, faith or religious freedom, our intellect, property and family. And ultimately, the goal is to achieve peace and justice, harmony and order. And one famous Muslim theologian, Imam Ibn al Qayyim, he explained really well what Sharia is really all about. And I'm gonna play this short video that I hope works out well. I came across this concise definition by one of the great classical scholars, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. He said, Sharia is based on wisdom and achieving people's welfare in this life and the afterlife. He further added, Sharia is all about justice, mercy, wisdom, and common good. Thus. Any ruling that replaces justice with injustice, mercy with its opposite, common good with mischief, or wisdom with nonsense, is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia, even if it is claimed to be so according to some interpretation. So again, as Imam al, -Al Qaim describes so well, Sharia is supposed to be all about just compassion, wisdom, and prosperity. And if it's not those things, then it's probably a shortcoming in human understanding or interpretation of Sharia. And when we talk about Sharia for Muslims in sort of our daily life, the way it applies are things like 
you know, our, our daily religious practices uh, like praying or fasting during Ramadan, dietary rules like prohibition on alcohol and pork, commands to be kind to our neighbors, to give in charity, to serve those in need, and, and really to work to bring benefit to society. There are commands to honor parents. And I have to tell you, this is something that actually exists in the Quran. There is a commandment that we are not supposed to even say uff to our parents. That, that literally shows up in the Quran. And I'll tell you, that's a challenge. But that is part of Sharia, right? It's tough, but it's there. And for Muslims living their religious principles, it means not investing their money in unethical ways. That This includes for Muslims in gambling or pornography or, you know, uh, uh, warfare in a way that harms people. This is like ethical investing. There are also financial limitations like restrictions on interest, which is why there's this whole industry of what's called Sharia compliant investments or mortgages to avoid the prohibition on interest. And that prohibition is really to avoid the gross inequity between the haves and the have nots. Um, that sort of interest uh, leads to that we even see in our country, uh, sort of the, uh, the, the great divide, the wealth gap that we see. And in the legal context, Sharia could have application on business contracts and in matters of marriage, divorce, inheritance, child custody, uh, child support, alimony, and so much more. There is also, of course, a penal code or punishment system as part of Sharia. But there are over 6,000 verses in the Quran, and less than 15 of them speak about any kind of sort of punishment. So it's less than one page. And even for any of uh, sort of the punishments to apply, there are multiple dozens of very strict conditions that have to be met. And jurists or rulers are supposed to bend over backwards to find any excuse not to apply any punishment because the purpose is mercy. Mercy is such an important component of the law. And every legal system has a punishment system. It's part of a checks and balances, but nobody is allowed to take the law into their own hands through any kind of vigilante justice or anything like that. You need to have sort of a due process of law. You need to have recognized courts who can actually hear sort of different positions. So vigilante justice is absolutely prohibited. Uh, Dr. Sabil Ahmed, he gave a great analogy. He said, imagine if, you know, if aliens came from Mars and they asked, what is the US constitution? And I responded by saying the US Constitution kills people by capital punishment. And then I went on to describe lethal injections or hangings or ele electrocution. Would that be a fair representation of what the US Constitution is? Of course not. It focuses on just a tiny piece of it and ignores the breadth and beauty of our Constitution. It ignores the majority and focuses on a tiny piece that only applies when certain strict conditions are met, including due process of law. And the same thing is true with Sharia. Only a tiny portion of Islamic laws related to crime and punishment, and the rest really speaks about things like respecting neighbors, honoring parents, being good to our fellow uh, Americans or people of any background, being good to minorities, you know, education, enhancing society, charity, all of these things. And different countries approach the implementation of Sharia differently. Some don't have it at all as part of their legal code. Some have it in some way, but not others. And there's no one way of interpreting things. And I wanna play this video that sort of goes a little bit into that very briefly. Law usually refers to the public sphere, but most of the Sharia's rulings are about private spiritual practice, such as prayer, fasting, charity, and so on. And while rulings on social relations from marriage, divorce, sales, contracts, and inheritance remain a living part of the Sharia, their implementation in modern societies varies from country to country. Sometimes it is based purely on personal conviction, as in the case of American Muslims voluntarily giving to charity or following Islamic finance laws. Importantly, very few of the areas of behavior and social relations that the Sharia governs have only a single rule on which all jurists agree. Scholars always accepted and recognized reasonable disagreement because interpretation could rarely provide complete certainty about God's intentions. Yet this did not mean that anyone could just impose their own understanding of God's law on others, especially through force. While the Sharia also encompasses certain rulings on civil procedure, aspects of crime and punishment, and even warfare, only public authorities could establish courts with the power to enforce Sharia rulings. Today, this has changed in a number of ways. In nations where Muslims are minorities, such as the United States, Muslim scholars emphasize that the Sharia makes it obligatory for Muslims to follow the secular laws of the lands where they live. 
in many Muslim majority countries, it is now the state alone and not scholars who specialize in the Sharia that decides what will be enforced in courts. And the state's rules are completely divorced from the sophisticated methods and culture of traditional scholars. So when we say that some modern states apply the Sharia, we need to remember that states may have picked and chosen certain rulings, but isolated rules alone don't represent the meaning and spirit of the Sharia. But this is what is still true for Muslims today. They see the Sharia as primarily about finding the path to God and about making this world an abode of justice. In other words, for Muslims, the Sharia is about protecting the most important human interests and values, life, religion, wealth, reason, family, and honor. So when a Muslim says she follows Sharia, that just means she refers to these rules as she lives her life. Does that mean she wants that to become the law of the land for everyone? No, not at all. She would actually be violating Sharia if that's what she was seeking. Unfortunately, that's not what we see or hear, particularly with a, an active effort by the anti-Muslim industry, which has tried to promote a very different and ugly divisive narrative. And they've used Sharia as a way, as a boogeyman to sort of you know, create fear and division. And they've done this to sort of maximize the sort of fear and otherness of Islam and Muslims. Over a decade ago, some of the more sophisticated groups actually started shifting their rhetoric from any kind of directly anti-Muslim sort of rhetoric to anti-Sharia as sort of a backdoor way to actually be anti-Muslim, right? Because ultimately people have rights, ideas do not. And anti-Sharia can feel like a logical, rational policy. It seems to resist uh, some scary sounding terms that again, they attribute horrible things to. And this, this is sort of uh, presented as a way to get support, even though if you directly came out and admitted what you're saying when you say you're anti-Sharia is that you're against Muslims having the freedom of religion in our country. This is why it's so important for us when we speak about these kinds of sort of misinformation out there to really address it as sort of anti-Muslim efforts, not just anti-Sharia. And the harsh penal codes that have been associated with Sharia, they're often fabricated or misinterpreted or decontextualized, again, for a very specific purpose, fear-mongering and division. Or they take instances of people acting in a criminal fashion to help support their sort of views of what Sharia is. And this sort of shift, of, instead of being directly anti-Muslim to sort of bringing up even well-researched terminology, like literally the words creeping Sharia, that was research and used to directly talk about Muslims. And that fear even infiltrated our legal and political systems, unfortunately. Since 2010, lawmakers in over 40 states introduced bills aimed at directly attacking Sharia. Some of those bills listed Sharia by name, but others referred more broadly to religious or cultural laws that would go against the fundamental liberties, rights, and privileges granted under the US and state constitutions. And bills like this that they've actually passed in 14 states, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. <clears throat> when you look at this, you might think, okay, well, hey, a great number of them didn't pass, that's wonderful. But something to keep in mind is that each one of these bills, whether it passed or it didn't, is a direct statement that Muslims should not have the same right to exercise their religion that every other person has in our country. And these bills are entirely unnecessary. They typically include a clause, again, prohibiting foreign law in American courts if it conflicts with the US Constitution, for instance. But that already, already is the case. We don't need a law to tell us that because the Constitution itself has a supremacy clause that denies any kind of authority to any foreign law or any kind of law that conflicts with it. So these bills are entirely unnecessarily and our constitution is already adequate to protect us from any other law taking over because the constitution is the supreme law of the land in our country. And in response to sort of the, this huge increase of anti-Sharia laws being introduced in so many different places, the American Bar Association even published a formal letter opposing these bills as unnecessary and raising concerns about them. And those concerns are valid because these are attacks, again, on the religious freedom of American Muslims. They are dangerous as they are a threat to religious freedom for all of us. And by explicitly singling out Muslims, they're used as a tactic, again, for division and fear mongering and demonizing and discriminating. They promote anti-Muslim bigotry, hate, and even violence, unfortunately. 
So in essence, that anti-Sharia movement, it was a campaign to create fear and spread misinformation. And the main guy behind the anti-Sharia legislation, David uh, Yerushalmi, he even admitted that what he was seeking was that friction, that sort of, you know, people talking about this, not that the actual bills were necessary or would do anything. He said, if this thing passed in every state without any friction, it would have not served its purpose. The purpose was heuristic, to get people asking this question, what is Sharia? That's what he was trying to achieve. So supposedly, in the name of protecting our US Constitution, what these anti-Sharia bills actually do is strip me as an American Muslim and, and sort of millions of other American Muslims of their right to religious freedom. And that is actually shredding our constitutional values. American Muslims only request that the law recognize their right to apply religious rules to their own lives. And in fact, as I said before, it would go against Sharia to apply those rules to someone who is not Muslim. And those who are religious of any background, they should be the ones who are most concerned with these kinds of efforts to restrict the practice of religious teachings. And let me give you a quick example of what it means to have courts consider you know, Islamic teachings that would be important to Muslims. When Muslims marry, I mentioned this uh, last week, uh, the man is obligated to promise a, a, a gift or a certain sum of money to the woman. It's sort of like a prenuptial agreement. And as we discussed last week, that money belongs entirely to the woman herself. She can do anything that she wants with it. Now, while we might have hope that this union of this couple is going to succeed and last forever, if the guy turns out to be a deadbeat, the woman should be able to go to court and get what was actually promised to her. If the court says, oh, this contract is based on Islamic teaching, so we can't look at it, we're actually taking away the protections that Islam directly grants to women. And this is something that exists in other, with other uh, faith traditions as well. Like the Jewish community, they have similar religious laws called halakha that are considered by courts. But again, they cannot trump the, the US constitution and they have to abide by concepts like public policy and everything else. It's a normal part of our legal system. But unfortunately, the anti-Muslim hate groups, they were a full blast in presenting the sort of Muslim version of this as somehow different and a threat to all of us when that is not the case. And the campaign that built sort of that fear and spread that was very active. In 2017, Act for America, the largest anti-Muslim group in our country, even organized rallies in cities across our country, including in Seattle, against Sharia. And these rallies were intended, again, to stoke fear and promote dangerous stereotypes about Muslims. I remember being at the one in Seattle, and this is a picture from, from me there in, Se uh, in the Seattle one. And even though the people there were against Sharia and they seemed to hate and fear it, they didn't even know what it was. And the only example, there was a reporter that went to and spoke to so many people there who were showing up against Sharia and asking them, give me an example of what this creeping Sharia is. Give me an example of how you see it happening. The only example that he was able to get, and he told me this when he came and spoke with me, the only example that somebody was able to provide is that community swimming pools have women only hours. That's the extent of you know, Sharia creeping into our lives. And again, that, those women only hours are not just for Muslims, it's for everybody. Uh, and it was just like bizarre that this is the only thing that people could identify because there actually is no threat of this. But sadly, that scary boogeyman, even though it's been exposed in a lot of ways, it is still used to target and attack American Muslims. There's even sort of, for instance, uh, tests of loyalty that are used with this, with elected leaders. Uh, there are elected leaders in our state who were sent uh, an email by anti-Muslim folks asking them to disclaim Sharia and you know, pledge their allegiance to the US Constitution instead, again, completely missing that the Sharia commands us to uphold the Constitution. There are polls that people, sh uh, that anti-Muslim groups or individuals use to say, oh, look at those Muslims, they're scary, they, they don't support, you know, whatever, by pointing out polls where Muslims say they support Sharia. Well, again, as a Christian, a Christian is going to say they support Christian teachings. As a Muslim, Muslims are going to say they support Islamic teachings. But there's this attempt to describe those who do support Islamic teachings and they're Muslim as somehow un-American. And that is completely wrong and has horrible consequences on everyday Muslim youth, students, uh, adults, 
women being attacked with head coverings and more. So I wanna close with some facts that are based on research and data from, the, from ISPU, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Fact, the majority of Muslims in America, they're US citizens, 86%. There's stronger, the stronger that a Muslim's religious identity is, the stronger their American identity is as well. 91% versus 68%. And this data directly challenges the myth that the Americanness and Muslimness of an individual are mutually exclusive. That is not the case at all. Fact. Let me see if I can. Okay, sorry, that top part is showing. Fact, frequent mosque attendance is also linked to greater civic engagement in our country. When whether that engagement is cooperating in the community to address problems or registering to vote or planning to vote. Fact, religion is very important in the daily lives of Muslims compared to other religious groups, second only to white evangelicals. However, Muslims do not seek to impose their religion on others. They are actually very high on private engagement over here, Muslims, very high on private engagement, but lower on public engagement compared to other groups. In fact, the groups that, the groups that seek to establish religious law in our country uh, the most are not Muslims. Muslims do not, the majority of Muslims, I should say, do not want religious law as a source of law for anybody. Bottom line, if we want to protect religious freedom for all, we must stand against these efforts that seek to demonize Islam and Muslims and doing so by upholding our constitutional principles, including the foundational freedom of, of religion and religious pluralism without discriminating against any specific religion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anila. And, and uh, I'm gonna speak for a few minutes uh, about um, about Christianity and Sharia just for a few minutes and, and also Judaism. And we just wanna encourage you to keep the good questions coming in the Q&A. And I just wanna say, Anila, every time you, you teach this, I learn a little bit more and I really appreciate uh, what, you, what you shared today. You know, so first off, um, an example I often use uh, is that if, uh, if I come over to your house and I steal your TV, and the police, you know, catch up to me and they say, well, Terry, why did you steal, you know, uh, so-and-so's TV? And I say, well, because I was afraid they were going to steal mine. That would not be an excuse for why I stole their TV. But what these anti-Muslim hate groups are trying to propose to us is that we should go ahead and take away the religious liberty of our Muslim sisters and brothers because of some fear that they're going to take away ours a fear that they themselves are generating through their hate speech. And so that's just silly. The best way to support and strengthen the human and civil rights of everyone in this country, whether they're religious or not, or whatever tradition they follow, is to strengthen all of our rights, not to take them away. And that's just really an important uh, democratic principle that I think all of us um, need to spend time and energy um, supporting and maintaining. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about Sharia and Christianity and, and Judaism a little bit. And the rabbis tell us that, of course, uh, there's this thing called halakha, which is the sort of a, a, a compilation of Jewish laws and teachings, including a lot of religious teachings as well. And, um, and the, the word halakha means the way or a path. Uh, Christianity itself was, uh, was a movement in the first century that often was referred to as the way. Uh, Jesus also encouraged uh, other people to understand that the I am, that is the creator of all, is the way, and that he was embodying that way in his life. So it's a very common term. In fact, the, the name of Paths to Understanding is sort of a nod uh, to that use of the term uh, path or walkway or, um, with respect to religious traditions. Uh, Buddhists have the, the middle way. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of traditions out there that use that kind of language. Um, so there are some similarities, of course, tremendous similarities between uh, Christian, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in terms of, of the teachings of Sharia. And I've gone over some of those about monotheism, the idea that there's one God, to, to care for your neighbor as you care for yourself, um, and to care for the, the animals and plants and ecosystem of our world. All of those are, are common. There are some differences. 
um, one of the differences, of, of course, is that is that Christians uh, really set aside very early kind of some of the purity codes of Judaism um, as they began to kind of form uh, their own their own tradition. And so for some people, it feels a little bit weird to have like, you, you know, don't eat pork. Um, in fact, I had an uncle call me up and tell me that that uh, I really should reconsider what I'm doing because Muslims were going to impose Sharia on us because uh, Costco was selling halal lamb. And so my question to him, of course, was, have you ever been to the ballpark? And they said, yeah. He said, yeah. And I said, well, uh, if, did you eat a, a kosher hot dog? And did that make you Jewish? <laughs> you know, no, the, the hot dog tasted good. <laughs> you know, so it's... Um, and, and we could talk about what halal's for some other time, which is really about being kind to animals. Is really what it's what it's all about. Uh, and so there's just there's some differences. There are real differences, but there's an awful lot of similarity and far more of it. And for us to to consider uh, in this country, you know, banning Sharia, well, really that's a way to start banning other other traditions as well. And I don't think we want to walk down that path um, as a nation. And like Anila said. Uh, the anti-Muslim hate groups, you know, they did a lot of study and they, what they did is they added Sharia to the word law. And, uh, you know, the law is kind of scary. It sort of tells you what to do. It's like a police officer pulling you over when you go too fast. Um, and Sharia is a, an Arabic term that people don't know. And that um, some groups, you know, claim uh, to be acting within when they do terrible things to people, just like the Lord's resistance army claims uh, to be following Jesus, to be following biblical uh, rules and and ethics when they're when they're murdering folks, and and of course we know that's that's ridiculous, and it is also ridiculous when people claim uh, to to act uh, out of Sharia when in fact they're they're doing nothing of the sort. Uh, there was a a big letter out to to uh, the leader of ISIS at one point talking about. Uh, 18 ways in which the leader of ISIS misunderstood or ignored the core teachings of Islam in his work. So, uh, but that, of course, doesn't make the news. What makes the news is the negative stuff. So now I want to take you through uh, sort of how you handle it when you're talking with somebody who's been kind of captivated by all the negative stuff. And let me let me uh, share my screen again and take you through a, a few slides here. This is this will be the second, the, the first time we talk about our messaging approach here and how you can talk with people. And then we'll go over it again next time and share some specific messages that work. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of challenges when people get into this uh, sort of fear-based mode. And of course, the first one is fear itself. Um, fear becomes real, even if the thing we don't that we're fearful of isn't really a threat to us, right? The feeling just kind of starts to take over. And the human heart is way too precious and beautiful to be taken over by fear, but it's there. And so we have to acknowledge that fear. Second, we have to understand that most people and most of us, including me, uh, don't always make uh, logical conclusions and then make decisions. Sometimes our, our guts kind of lead us to, to an assumption and then over time, we find other rationale to help back up that moral intuition. So we have to understand that a lot of our decisions as people is really based on more intuitions or, or gut, gut sort of in, um, decisions than it is like logic. And that's where confirmation bias, of course, comes in. That we as human beings tend to take in information that agrees with our position, and we tend to resist information that causes uh, uh, some question or some doubt or perhaps complicates our point of view. And that's just true of human beings. It's true of me too. And then lastly, we have to understand the power of in-groups and out-groups. Um, so we all are part of a group. And, and over, over the, the, the course of human development, we've realized that groups are really important for our survival. And so we get very strong feelings about our in-group, like what happens at a football game between WSU and Oregon, right? For, for, for no reason, we're just shouting like crazy against the other team because we, we are perceiving to be part of that in-group. But is that group really all that important from a survival or human or, or values perspective? Well you know, not always, right? So here's you, you're a person. How can you kind of start to help 
uh, to, to, to bridge this gap between, between folk that are fearful? Well, one part of it is that you're part of an in-group and you maintain your identity with and your participation in that in-group and that's a really good thing. But part of what we can do to help is to, is to start to move ourselves into a place where we're relating to an in-group and also relating to an out-group that may be feared. And as we begin to do that work of relating to that out-group, some people in our in-group will start to say, well, hey, um, maybe I could go with you and meet some of those people. And so then the people in the in-group and the out-group start to get to know each other and they realize how much they have in common and that they're all so different from each other. And that those differences actually add flavor and an incredible capacity for making better decisions because we're different, but we still share a lot of things in common. And working within your in-group and staying part of it and relating to an out-group that's being feared, both of, that, both of those are extremely important. So we want to say that when we're working to counteract you know, fear with people, we want to make sure we are trying to speak primarily to persuadable people. So when Neela and I don't spend all of our emotional or spiritual energy, you know, our, our, our time trying to, or trying to reach unreachable people or to persuade the opposition. We're trying to work with persuadable people. And we, and we also always realize that that's kind of up to them, whether they want to be persuaded or not. It's not up to us to force them into that. And so what we try to do is, is to offer three pieces, three things that really help people to, to remove fear, to have an opportunity to take fear out of the, the center of their heart. Number one is to talk about shared values. And that can also mean talking about some, some differences, but build on some shared values that we have. Number two, share a positive story with people about the group that is feared. And those positive stories, they won't work right away. They won't like change people overnight. You can't expect it to, but start telling those positive stories because again, we live in a media environment in which almost the only stories we hear about anybody are negative. I mean, I was talking to a Roman Catholic priest recently, and he was just lamenting how a lot of the good work Roman Catholics do around the country to deal with poverty are just not told. But other stories, of course, have predominance. So we only hear the negative about each other. And those positive stories are like water in a desert for us to be able to see each other in a more positive light. And then lastly, follow up with some information. And, and uh, some of the information just could be the way American Muslims or whatever what other group is being dehumanized are contributing to our larger society in, in beautiful and positive ways. And so the change process typically begins with relationship. And, and we know that, that information is good, but even more powerful than positive stories are people being able to get to know American Muslims. The problem is that American Muslims make up about 1% of the population. And that means that they would have to have 100 best friends. And that's pretty exhausting, which is where allies can come in. We can kind of share some of those positive stories. We can help people to understand in our, in our own in-groups that, that, um, that we respect and have gotten to know American Muslims. And we can share some of those, uh, those stories in, in, of our own relationship with them. And then lastly, I should say that we that the most powerful thing of all in a, in a kind of a change process is really work for the common good. Um, when we get together and build the, the communities, uh, respond to a need in our community, that's one of the most profound things. So I'm just gonna share a couple of these to make sure that we have time for um, just kind of the basics of an approach before we have, have time for Q&A. So before you respond to somebody, um, I really want to encourage you to consider the context. Is this a private situation? Is it within your own community? Is it a public setting? Is it a media engagement? The, the more you go down that list, the more careful you got to be. Okay. So before you respond to something, consider the context and make sure that you're calm enough to respond. Number two, consider the person. Is this a genuine confusion or misinformation? Are they kind of playing gotcha? Is it some kind of competition? Are they pretty hardened in their perspective? And then also think about who else is listening and make sure that, um, that you're responding in the, in the most positive way you know, to that person. But as you hear their question, we wanna encourage you to meet the emotion and not the myth. 
So acknowledge and empathize with their emotions, with what they're valuing, with what they're, what they're fearful about. But don't try to repeat the messaging. Don't like, and, and don't necessarily contradict it right away, right? Help them understand that you hear their concern. And that will be a really important and powerful way for you to begin the conversation. So I'll continue more about how we do messaging and how we have conversation with people next time. But for now, let's make that enough so that we have enough time to get into our Q&A session. And we have some really great questions and we wanna follow up with those. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, dear brother, Terry. Uh, yes, we've gotten some great comments and questions as well. Uh, one question or one comment is just that uh, somebody says, wish more people knew this uh, and, and thank you for doing this. I agree. I do wish more people knew this so they wouldn't fall victim to the misinformation propaganda efforts that are out there that again, only divide and hurt us all as Americans. Uh, we also have several questions here. So let me go ahead and answer uh, some of those. Uh, one question that we have is, uh, what does it mean to protect wealth? Uh, so that specifically is about essentially property rights, you know, protecting people's rights to property. So if I own something, somebody can't just come and steal it. Uh, and that was one of the purposes of Sharia is to protect, you know, life, protect property or wealth, uh, uh, protect sort of uh, family relationships uh, and more. So that's what the wealth piece is really about property rights uh, that are very uh, important in, in sort of Islamic teachings. Um, there's also a question. So when a woman uh, is uh, jailed for driving a car or going out with uh, going out without a male relative is that related to Islam at all either in terms of the violation or the punishment and I would say no I mean first off that's only in one specific Muslim majority country uh, and as we discussed or heard in the video that I played as well different countries have different approaches um, I'll tell you that at the time of, of the prophet peace be upon him uh, women were literally riding camels which I was <laughs> I'm sure is a lot harder than riding a car <laughs> So, or driving a car. So no, that is unique to one country and their decisions that is, you know, separate from Islamic teachings and different scholars, you know, completely disagree with that. And in fact, even that prohibition is being changed and is no longer going to be in place or is no longer in place. So there are changes that are being made, uh, but sometimes what individual countries choose to do like we talked about women's rights, they often do it for reasons other than religion and then try to sugarcoat it with this, you know, veneer of religious permissibility or pr religious uh, appropriateness when it absolutely is not the case. And this is not unique to Islam. Islam. Uh, we saw it, of course, with, we've seen it with Christianity, uh, justifying the Crusades or the Spanish Inquisition or, you know, what happened in, in our country with Native Americans and so much more. So uh, that is, is not tied to sort of Islamic teachings, uh, and it is not the case in the overwhelming majority of Muslim majority countries, uh, and, and certainly is not something that uh, we would support in any shape, way, or fashion. Uh, Brother Terry, yeah, really, do you have anything to add to those two before we move yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate your your response, Anila, and I I, I want to say that we need to make a, a distinction between the core teachings of a religious tradition, the way that religious tradition gets enculturated in different cultures, and then the way that gets kind of put into laws in in specific countries. There are fifty, nearly fifty, majority Muslim countries in the world. And isn't it interesting that the only story we hear about women and driving is the one in the one country <laughs> uh, where, where it was not allowed? It's just, isn't that interesting how, how, how that's, that's the story that was told? And then people, because we don't know much about Islam, uh, then we begin to impose that in our imagination um, on, on other people. So we need to make that clear distinction. And we got to remember that, that there are majority Muslim countries that have had women presidents. You know, so for goodness sake, there's there's a lot of diversity in the way that the way that um, the way and the way um, uh, rights and laws are written in those different countries. Okay. Uh, another question we have is: I wonder whether Islam or Sharia would have anything to say if a transgender woman showed up to women-only swim times. Um, so the example I gave that people identified as the only instance where they could see Sharia creeping into our sort of daily life uh, was the example of community swimming pools having women-only hours. Uh, so I want to be clear: those are community swimming pools. They they would not the, the decision of who to allow or not allow is not in the hands of Muslims. They would be in the hands 
hands of that community center uh, that has the swimming pool. So Islam or Sharia would have nothing to say about that. That would be a decision made by those individual community centers. Having said that, in Islamic uh, uh, teachings or Islamic law, it's actually interesting because uh, uh, you know folks. Uh, intersex and transgender folks have existed sort of throughout history and they exist through, uh, you know, in, in Muslim majority places as well. Uh, and sort of Islamically, uh, one of the things that was specifically there is that you allow people to make that choice of what gender they are choosing and then you treat them based on that. And I say that recognizing that there's also a lot of diversity again in understandings of Islamic teachings. But there is a specific teaching that I know of that exists even in classical Islam. So well before the current transgender movement that we are seeing for transgender rights, uh, this existed throughout classical Islamic periods where people could choose a gender that might be different from the one that they were assigned at birth and then uh, follow through with that gender. And in that situation, uh, presumably they would be part of the women only uh, sections as well. Terry, do you want to add anything to that? You know, it's just, uh, it's, I, I think it's, it's true that the Abrahamic traditions care about how governance happens. Like, I think they all care about it. Uh, Judaism began really in the experience of slavery in Egypt, and, and even more so in Babylon. Christianity began under Roman occupation, uh, where, again, like I said earlier, where, where, the, where Caesar was like dominating uh, the people of, of Palestine at the time. They, they care about it. Islam also cares about how governance happens. Um, but all of them, uh, but none of them are trying to propose a specific exact uh, organizational structure for that government, right? And, and, and uh, th there are some basic principles that are really important that we, that we all really basically share, but there's not like a specific thing. And so there is in this country, however, some Christians who kind of have an authoritarian leaning who want to impose their Christianity on everyone else. And I think sometimes our, the, the fear that people have around Islam is really some frustration with certain uh, folk who claim to be Christian, right? who identify as Christian, who are trying to impose their way on everybody else. It's sort of a way of, of taking the one and imposing it on our Muslim sisters and brothers when that is in fact not what they're about at all. Thank you for that, Brother Terry. Uh, I see, Ashley, your hand is raised. So do you want to ask a question before we get to the continued Q&A? Yeah, actually, I have two. So the first is, I'm curious. Um, sometimes, Anila, you'll say, peace be upon him after you say certain names. So I'm wondering about that. I'm wondering what's, why, and I'm just curious. And then the second is, um, Reverend Terry, you talked about how we can treat our Muslim neighbors but I'm wondering if you have any concrete examples or language or ideas that we can use if we witness one of our Muslim neighbors being discriminated against or bullied or picked on. Um, do you have some ideas of what someone like me could say? I'll, Let's have I'll Anila go first. Yeah, I'll answer the, the quick one first and then we can go into the, the second question. Uh, so peace be upon him or her is something that Muslims are taught to say after the name of any prophet. Uh, and it's specifically a way of sort of sharing uh, blessings or uh, prayers onto that person, uh, because we are told that when we sort of share those blessings on that person, whether it's Prophet Muhammad or other prophets throughout history, uh, that those prayers come back to us as well. So it's, it's a tradition uh, that we are taught. And I'm gonna quickly share one story. There was, there was an imam who actually, because this is in Islamic teachings, everybody says, peace be upon him uh, or her, and it's shortened P-B-U-H. So this imam, he was in a class uh, and he had written this, this uh, story about Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, and specifically put that parenthetical P-B-U-H after Jesus's name. And the Christian teacher in that class came to him and was like, oh, how can you say Jesus poo? You know, and he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that it is a sign of respect and, and explained the acronym is peace be upon him. So it's, you know, P-B-U-H, but it's not anything negative. It's something positive and respectful. <laughs> I hope that answers it. Terry? Yeah, you know, so I, I think the, the, the core to this, this is to be mindful. And, and obviously, if you're going to respond to somebody who's agitated or potentially violent, you know, towards someone who's Muslim, like call 911, right? And, and, and make sure you're safe, of course. 
but the, 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 the core of this is, is who are we? You know, so if you're in an organization like 4-H, what are some of the, the core values that 4-H stands for? How can you appeal to those if you're part of an in-group with this person, say if this person happens to be Christian and you happen to be Christian or you're atheist and they happen to be atheist, what are some of the shared values that you have about how we treat others that we can kind of call people to? Because in this context of incredible fear, you know, fear just kind of takes, us, takes people over. Like that person that's kind of bullying or saying negative things about that person. Remember, they've been fed negative stuff by the anti-Muslim hate industry. They've been fed stuff by, by some political leaders. Like it's all just in them. And they're, they're trying to protect something they love. They're not trying to be a bad person. And that's the, that's the way dehumanization works is it, it takes us, it, it wants us to, to protect and defend something we love but sort of excuse behavior uh, that we wouldn't really want to engage in, but we kind of excuse it toward others. And so in a very calm voice, you know, just try to recall that person to some shared values that they have about how, what kind of community are we trying to build? What kind of country are we trying to be? And one of the key, the key phrases, of course, here is that this is a country based on religious freedom. And we want to make sure that everybody has the right to practice or not practice as they're called, I mean, don't you agree with me, you might say, right? And then and then slowly kind of calm that conversation down and, and build on those shared values together and then begin to build uh, some more uh, experience with the group that folks might be fearful of. That's a fast answer to a complex question. Yeah. And, I, and I would just want to add to that, that uh, what are the messaging uh, techniques or tips that I've given to people is if you're, you know, let's say at a dinner table with family or you're in another setting and somebody makes ugly anti-Muslim comments uh, or anti-Islamic comments, uh, you don't have to, again, debate them or attack them, call them racist. You don't have to do any of that. Uh, what you could just do is say, you know what, that's not true. Let me tell you about the Muslims I know. And then you go into personal stories. And when you do that, again, the emotion changes and they can't debate with you on these personal stories or personal experiences. And this is how you bring in the, the impact, the power of personal stories in really creating change. Because when people hear these stories, it removes some of that negative emotion of fear or anything else. And it can actually help address the root cause in a way that can be effective. There's also a lot of bystander training that's available for folks to become allies. And there's actually this one flyer that I'm gonna put in the, uh, in the chat for everybody. It gives a specific sort of techniques or, or tactics on if you see somebody harassing, let's say a Muslim woman, what you can do. And one of the things they say is instead of addressing the, the person who's hating or, or bullying or attacking, to go sit with the person who's being attacked and show solidarity and support and speak to them and show them that they're not alone in this. So those are some additional things. Um, we're very short on time, but we do have one more question. And this is uh, about the following the laws of the land where you live. The question is, what if you live in a country with discriminatory laws? Are you still supposed to follow those laws and just work to change them? I'll tell you, unsurprisingly, there's a difference of opinion on this, like on so many other things within sort of Islamic uh, scholarship. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the, what I consider the prevailing view uh, is that if there are unjust laws, you have permission to do things nonviolently, of course, like civil disobedience. Uh, and that's why you have had and currently have Muslims participating even in civil disobedience uh, and, and movements to challenge un, uh, injustice in our country and around the globe. So there is that permission, but again, you have to, to the extent possible, follow the Islamic teachings of not harming anyone, not hurting anything, not you know, destroying property, not doing all, all of the kinds of things that exist. You're supposed to follow those edicts, but uh, you can engage in civil disobedience. I hope and, that answers. And just to add, that, add to that super briefly is that in many places, in many places around the world where there are unjust laws, uh, women, for instance, are using the basic core principles of Sharia to counteract anti-woman uh, misogynist laws. And, and so Sharia is far from some kind of a oppressive thing. It's like all religious teachings. They can help to clarify the moral and ethical um, uh, you know, changes that need to be made in the society so that we can live together in peace. Ashley, you wanna? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I don't know, this is awesome. 
my husband was sitting across from me giggling at some of your guys' jokes and, um, and everything. So it was, I just, I can't imagine learning everything I want to learn by next week. So I imagine I'm going to have a hundred million questions. Although I will say every time I had a good question, I had to check it off because you answered it in your speeches. <laughs> so I think you're doing a really good job of anticipating what someone like me, who's very ignorant of, of, of Islam, um, in this particular challenge. So, um, thank you so much for, for everything. Thank you to everyone who's shown up. Thank you to Beth for popping out those questions. I love the, you ask them. Um, and, just thank you so much and Adasha for this connection. Again, I'm learning so much. So thank you. And I really can't wait for next week.